All right, this next lab you'll be doing is Lab 9 from Physics 185. And the next series of labs we'll do over the next few weeks will explore um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The first law we're going to, or the, the law we're going to look at in this lab is Kepler's second law. And if you've gone through this part of the class, you know that Kepler's law tells us that the planets will sweep out equal areas in equal times. What that really just means is when the planet is closer to um, the sun, it will move faster, and when a planet is farther away from the sun, it will move slower. Uh, the same law that governs the behavior of the planets around the sun will also govern the behavior of the moon around the planet. And in this lab, what you will be trying to do is verify Kepler's second law. That is, when the planet, when the moon is closer to the planet, it will move faster, and when it's farther away, it will move slower. And you may remember that Kepler's second law is just really a restatement of conservation of angular momentum, where the angular momentum is defined as the mass of the object times its speed times its radius. And so if we write that equation down, where L is the angular momentum, m is the mass of the planet, v is its speed, and r is its radius, you can see if this stays constant, then when r decreases, v has to increase in order to represent it. So what you are going to do today is essentially verify that if you take the product of the speed and the radius of a moon, that will be equal to a constant value, and you will measure the speed and the distance of a uh, moon for your planet over the course of this particular life. Let's go ahead and look at what this will look like in virtual astronomy. So when you choose the lab, orbit of the moon at Kepler's second law, you will get a view of the sky that's taken at one particular um, time of day, and then a second view of the sky that's taken one hour later. And as you can see, the moon has moved just a little bit to the right when you compare the two diagrams. For each day, what you are going to do is you are going to measure the distance of the moon on that day and how fast it is moving. To find the distance, what we will do is we will use radar. We will take a radar signal, bounce it off the moon, and measure the amount of time it takes that radar signal to return. Since we know the radar is moving at the speed of light, we can just simply find the time for the round trip, divide by two to take the time it takes the light to get to the moon from the Earth, and use that to find the distance to the moon. To find the speed of the moon at this particular time, what we will do is find the angular speed by how much does this moon change its position in the sky, and then knowing the distance, we can use that angular speed to help us understand how fast that moon is, that moon is moving through the sky. To find the distance to the moon, what you need to do is you need to make sure your sensor is lined up with the moon so that when the radar signal reflects you actually measure that and to do that you'll need to move your telescope so that the moon is centered in its field of view. We can move the telescope and notice that when the moon in the left hand window is centered in my field of view I will get a return signal indicating that the radar has hit the moon and bounced back. To find the time I just simply need to count the divisions between when the signal left, this dip right here, and when the signal returns, this dip right here. Notice you're given a scale here that tells you that each one of these divisions represents two tenths of a second. You'll actually have a spreadsheet set up to help you make that calculation. To measure how fast the moon has moved, my suggestions would be that you go ahead and you display the grid. And then just simply line up the moon so that the initial view of the moon is such that the left edge of the moon lines up with the side of this window. And then one hour later, it's very easy to count from the edge of this window to the location of the moon. So one hour later, this moon has moved Oh, a little bit less than one, maybe nine-tenths of a grid square in the sky. You will do this repeatedly, roughly every three days. You will measure the new um, position and the new speed of the moon. You can move through this particular lab by going, just clicking next day and collecting the data. Notice you're going to have to recenter the moon in each of these different days to get the signal. 
The spreadsheet, let's just take a quick look at that. If we open up the spreadsheet, you can see what's being asked, what you're being asked to do. You're being asked to find the distance and the speed. In the distance, what you're prompted to find is the number of squares. And then if we just move across and look at what's calculated, the time is going to be the number of squares times the scaling factor. See that it shows 0.2. And then we don't want the round trip time. That would give us twice the distance. And so we divide that round trip time by two to get the time it takes that signal to go to the moon. We then find the distance in meters by multiplying that time times the speed of light in meters per second. And then we can go ahead and actually get a calculation for one over the distance. Again, if you look at the angular momentum, if we plot the speed times one over the distance, we should also get a constant value. To find the speed of the, um, the moon, you would count the number of grid lines. So for example, what I had just done, as I had said, it was about 0.9 grid lines. Then what this will calculate is this will calculate the um, speed of that moon in degrees per hour. Each of that field of view was one degree, so it takes the number of um, grid lines, divides by 10, to give you the speed in degrees per hour. Then you need to convert that to a speed in radians per second. And so this factor just converts from degrees per hour to radians per second. Notice the pi over 180 converts us from degrees to radians, and the 3600 converts from hours to seconds. To get the speed then, once we have our angular change in radians per second, we can get the actual physical speed in meters per second by just taking the angular speed in radians per second and multiplying by the distance. This last column then will calculate the product. And remember, Kepler's second law says the product should be constant. And as you begin to enter data into your um, spreadsheet, this graph will automatically plot those data for you. If you have any questions about this lab, please feel free to email me. Good luck. Um, let me just show you the check your answers feature for this particular lab is actually pretty straightforward. It just simply shows you what your plot of speed versus distance should look like. You do not need to do a screen capture of this. This would be a pretty standard format. All you need to do is submit your graph from your spreadsheet along with the data that you've collected. Good luck.